<laughs> All right. Um, I actually saw patient zero here, believe it or not. When I was just a baby, I was just, it's amazing, <laughs> 1981. So, um, so anyway, let me just figure out how to do this. So, um, so this was, you know, this is where we are now. Everybody said, they didn't hardly mention the word cure, uh, but now everybody's banging at the door saying it's time for the cure. It's time for us to, to like, talk about it. And um, so cure, and then I put remission. I had cure up there sort of as the circuitous route to there, but remission, I think, is where we are, or where we're, we're heading. And so the challenges for the path to cure um, it is a mission from NIH and DAIDS, um, and looking for innovative approaches. I'm just mentioning things that don't even exist right now, use of nanoparticle <coughs> delivery, but I think they will. I think that's where we're going. Adults, children, newborns, and, and I will talk much more about the barriers of latent virus, which is one of the reasons that um, we have a difficult thing with this. So I'll talk about early treatment and uh, more potent to reduce, reduce the establishment of, of reservoirs in both adults and children. It's not just children. Um, the other approach is in those that have chronic infection, purge HIV reservoirs and then, and then treat and then potentially use combination of ways to enhance the immunity so you keep in remission. And then the other thing you've probably heard about, which I'll talk about, is host resistance and stem cells using the naturally resistant stem cells, um, CCR5 delta 32 homozygous, that's natural, um, uh, and then or, or trying to do the same thing using gene therapy to make a resistant host cell. Um, there, I will talk about some of these things that, you know, people will say, well, and I'll talk about the Berlin patient. We're not going to be doing that on a mass scale, but the, it's a concept so that what we could do eventually, and then like <clears throat> using autologous stem, uh, stem cell transplants with the manipulation of these co-receptors, CCR5 and uh, CXCR4, you actually can manipulate them in vitro and make cells resistant, um, and then you can re-infuse um, them in. And then a lot of other immune um, combination approaches. So the barriers or a, to a cure, a functional cure, um, is really this pool of reservoirs. And also the other part of it is a continual low-level HIV replication, even when people are on treatment, that there are little blips and things uh, that can happen even when they are suppressed. So there may be just incomplete, <coughs> intermittent and incomplete reactivation of these latent viruses. Um, and then these, I think people were very um, upset uh, 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 because when some of the information came out, um, this is like uh, about how long these reservoirs can live. So this is um, a cartoon of this so that the virus is replicating as you can uh, see here. And when, the, when you have acute HIV, you start therapy it will drop it, drop down all the active virus, and maybe a little bit here, but early on, um, the cells may, the, uh, the establishment of the reservoir may have already occurred. Um, and so then it also can, can uh, even though you detect nothing in the plasma, the reservoir is still there. Um, this was the, what I was saying that people were disturbed about when silicono showed that this was looking at the quantity of virus in the reservoirs over time. So like it didn't change. This is adults. So then he estimated that the half-life of this reservoir, if you're already in chronic infection, was 73 years, which you, that's the half-life, so you, unless you live much longer, <laughs> which I don't think you're going to do. Um, and then children, the same thing, look like in chronic infection in children, look like that was, you know, just watching the half-life, hoping it was going to de decay over time. So that's <clears throat> that's where we are a few years ago. Um, 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 you can quantitate, um, silicone has a method to quantitate 
replication confident virus. So virus that actually grows. You take the cells, dilute them out, and count you know, how many cells per, per million are infected. So it's called the, um, so they take out T cells and then count them out. And so you can actually, it's a, it's a laborious process, but it is, it is considered the gold standard of, is the virus there? It in, uh, is years. Let me go back. Yeah. That's five for these children. Um, they were started on heart, so it hadn't changed in that time. And this is like up to seven years. So, the, so from the, the they can. Is they made it because it didn't change. So in other words, it, it was the there was actually no decay, <coughs> almost very little decay. Here's the line, the that. red line. Are you a mathematician? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> okay, it sounds like that. That's good. Um, so, <clears throat> so again, this is sort of summarizing that, that during chronic infection. But what's interesting now, and this has all happened in the last few six months or so, there's new emerging data from early treated infants that if they're treated early, even that's not that early, less than three months of age, and they remain viral suppressed, viral decay continues over time. So um, Catherine Lazuriaga published last year um, that there were teenagers, she had uh, looked at a few of them who were treated early, not, not like a few hours or days, but um, less than three months or less than six weeks of age when they were started on therapy. And by the age of 15, they had um, negative antibody and they had no detectable HIV DNA or RNA. They were still on therapy, but uh, basically they looked like I mean, if you tested their antibody or anything, they look negative. Um, so early on, this is recent data from uh, Debbie Persaud uh, showing this is early treatment of infants and showing that this is actually the DNA, um, DNA viral. Now we can measure DNA. Before we couldn't really measure it. Now there's a, what they call a digital drop, which is the newest way to measure by PCR digital drops, so you can quantitate it very precisely how much DNA is there. We all know about RNA, right? But DNA, uh, we are, I never even checked again on most of the kids because it was going to be positive. You know, we never heard of it going negative or we didn't have a proper way to quantitate it. Now we do. Um, and so this, this is going down and uh, kids treat it, so it does actually have a decay curve here. Um, and the other thing is this was some of the studies done on a study done some time ago where, again, they're trying to estimate the half-life. This is looking on this axis is what I was saying is the resting CD4 T cells, the ones that actually grow virus. So this is taking the cells, diluting them out. And um, they looked at children at uh, 24 weeks post-treatment and persistence. So you can see that. The red here are the ones that were treated the earliest in the red. And <coughs> there's a significant drop in the, in the number of uh, reservoir cells that are replication confident, which is what really matters um, in these children. And these aren't as early treated. So if you were to do the half-life here, it would be 11 months. So infants treated before six weeks had the most restricted reservoir size. So this is sort of exciting and, and uh, but this was in the face of all this is when things happened like the Mississippi baby. Um, so, so the half-life of re reservoirs is significantly shorted, shortened if treated during acute infection. The decay curves, not just, just the level, but the decay curves are accelerated. So the, it seems like the earlier you do it, the faster it decays. Um, Could I just ask, um, are little kids infected in utero or? Well, they, they can be infected in utero or at the time of delivery so or this, by breastfeeding. So does this um, reduction in the res reservoirs, do they, can they figure out at all which kids it's are exact, in utero? Uh, I, um, in the studies we're doing now, yes. In some of the older ones, they didn't differentiate. 
but um, between whether the baby, the, the way we do it is, it, are they positive by PCR at birth or not? It's, it's pretty, pretty basic. And then if they're negative at birth and subsequently positive, like in the first weeks of life, it's usually intrapartum. If they're breastfed, they could, they could get it until they stop breastfeeding. <clears throat> but, um, but we, we can, you know, I'm, many years ago, we, I made a definition for in utero versus intrapartum versus breastfeeding. And people still use that simple uh, way to do it, because I think it does make a difference. But, um, but we, we're like getting more information and there's more inter, uh, you know, things from cohorts and from past cohorts that we're trying to better define this. And I have a cohort here that's for a long time and, um, and I have samples uh, from when they were born to when they were 18, believe it or not. And so I, I would like to, I tested some of them and a lot of them are actually seronegative. They have a negative Western blot. So it's a surprise to me that they're, you know. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, more like I say, we need more information, and also in adults. Now, since since the Mississippi baby and things like that, all the adult group, we're suddenly. I said you should c treat acute infection. You know, why don't you? Why do we wait and treat later? Why not treat now? Nope, for ten years or more, everybody waited until you really needed it because it would be the rest of your life. So um, now there's an interest, and now there's gathering data in adults that the same thing happens, looks like. You just can't diagnose them early enough to treat them early enough. So that's where you guys can, can help. Um, so, so there's more, yeah. So, so are there data showing that in adults you find the same sort of accelerated decay curve? There, it's being gathered. I simply know some of it from Steve Beeks and others that I know are doing it. And there's a study in Thailand that are, is done very well by Janenta. Uh, she has a long name, anyway. <laughs> I always say her name. Anyway, she's, she's been doing it in adults in Thailand through the Red Cross. And uh, she's treated them before they, s before they have any antibody, really in the early uh, stages of acute infection. And yeah, it's going to be harder in adults because, again, to pick them up so early is hard. But in those that, there was one that was in a, that Steve Deeks had that had was, uh, was in a prophylactic study. You know, they were being tested and um, when they turned, the first time they turned positive in that study, he treated. And that, that particular subject um, is out, I don't know, probably 18 months or, we don't know the, the curve, but all I know is that the DNA went to be undetectable. Wow. All right, so anyway, so that's why I think there's more hope. So the mission is to identify interventions to block established and or maintenance of reservoirs and uh, leading to viral remission and cure. So, so that's what, what we're trying to do. Um, approaches, and I'm, I'm going to, I can't go through all this, but I'm just going to give you the, the ideas. Remission, HIV, cure. So it's sort of like the cancer situation years ago, you know, where, I mean, somebody from from Hemog said, you know, it's not going to be cure right away. It's remission. You're going to look for remission first, and then, then eventually, step by step. But uh, where we are, the, the only true success is the Berlin patient, which was a transplant, which I'll talk about. Um, latency reversal agents are for chronic infection, which would be, there, in adults, there have been some studies showing that you give certain inhibitors who could sort of kick and kill, so you kick out the virus, and, um, and they're, they, they've seen uh, rises in the uh, HIV and those that were suppressed when they, when they did use these agents. Um, <clears throat> but it's still way behind. I mean, they're looking at different agents to do it better. But I think we can also learn something from the transplant business. Um, Immune-based therapies, there's, now there's, incredible broad neutralizing antibodies that are available and that are being used and planned in the CURE agenda for adults and for kids. Um, therapeutic vaccines, there actually are some uh, that are looking promising, um, including making a vaccine against your own virus. <clears throat> um, 
and gene therapy. I mean, uh, Irvin Chen and a lot of the people here are working on that aspect of things. Um, and then uh, I'm going to talk more about the very early antiviral therapy. Question? Yeah. Disulfiram works how? Um, it, in, it, it reverses the latency. In other words, it's a latency reversal and kicks the virus. Um, there's all different kinds that do it, but this would um, kind of kick it out of being in, in integrated or in partial integration in the virus. And um, exactly how it does it, I don't know. But that's, that's an anti-alcohol medicine, right? It can be used, yes. I don't know why it does it, but it's it does. Use, yeah. yeah. Use, right? so it, it, yeah. It, it, how it does it? I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, to do it. But there, this is just one of them. Yeah. Huh. Fascinating. Yeah. So, and there, it does it in vit they, They're looking for those that do it in vitro. So they're taking drugs from a variety of areas to see which would do it the best. Yeah. Um, so it's multi-pronged um, approaches for infection, and this was where you guys, you know, um, also need to help. It's multi-pronged. You need to identify and treat as early as possible. We're not identifying um, adults, and we don't identify all the kids either because we don't identify their mothers. Um, so new strategies early prior to antibody identification. There are different strategies for doing that. I know that where you can, they do finger sticks and, uh, and um, looking for those in uh, high-risk situations. The idea would be to maximally rapid reduction of the virus, and we're still not there in kids. We, you know, we need better drugs and more um, enhanced way to do it to establishment both in children and adults. Reduce the reservoirs in chronic infection, meaning they're, they're established, but to try and get the virus out of the, of the and then treat with enhanced, I don't think it's going to be done without the use of a therapeutic vaccine or antibody or I don't think so, um, and host resistant, resistant engineering of cells. So this was my claim to fame in 1995, where I reported the first baby cleared of, of HIV spontaneously. All right, and I got a lot of grief for this one. But um, it actually um, still stands. There were reports after this of lots of other babies that, and um, I, uh, I think we're revisiting it again now, um, and I'll, I'll tell you in a minute. Um, so why babies? This was even, I think I made this up before we even knew about the Mississippi baby. Um, it's an excellent model for, because you know the timing of infection, you know they're born. And as you asked, they could be infected before birth and born with it, but it could be a few days or it could be several months. It's probably not longer because otherwise they might have been lost before they were born. Um, <clears throat> and then we know a lot more about how much virus they have when they're born. And, uh, and so that we already know that um, you can get it at, at birth or in, by breastfeeding. And the virus is homogeneous at that point. So in adults as well, it's, it's almost, it's just the same. It's like one got through, and so it's very homogeneous. And it's easier to treat them. It's not so diverse. Um, and uh, as I just told you that, I'm s some of it's repetitive, I'm sorry. So anyway, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So if you were able to, to do something early on, um, uh, we already know these things about kids. We know that if you treat them even at birth, you're going to pr reduce infection by 50%, which means that something's happening in that time. It's probably replicating in the GI tract at that point um, because they swallow it. Yeah. Um, so this is just showing, this was studies we did some time ago. In utero, I mean, the inter this is interpartum infection. This is in utero at the very first time point. And all this means is that if it's one line like this, it's homogeneous. Sometimes there's more than one transmitted, uh, rarely, but these are each one of these are an individual baby. So in general, um, there's usually one transmitted. And then this was showing at birth, 
I have a much different one now. But you can see that the level of virus can vary from hardly anything, 100, this is RNA, to millions, you know. So, um, and then the baby is at interpartum has none detected. Um, so that they, the starting point may be different. So we wouldn't expect even treating babies at birth to have a success in all of them because they would already have established latency. So this is a cartoon I made. This aborted was because of the baby. I still think it happens. I don't think we document it as well, but I do think there are cases that are aborted. Um, and then there's, <coughs> this is to, to show in utero, there's the rapid, which usually are the very rapid, and children are different than adults because they don't have the cell-mated immunity. They have some antibody from the mother, but they don't have it. So the rapids, you know, that they can die within, if they're not treated, two years, four years, um, very early, much more rapid because they, they have this, uh, they don't have like adults where it goes up and down. And then there are slow that gradually, but this is over years. This is not like over a few months like adults. So uh, this one, oh, I don't know if I didn't know I had this in here, sorry. This is, okay, but this is a study from Thailand in adults and, and uh, HIV negative sex workers where they were doing this. They did a finger stick twice a week for testing. Um, and uh, this is, uh, this is the acute in adults. And so you can see here the time to viral load peak was 16 days. The time to antibody was uh, 20 days. So um, range 12 to 24 days. So it's not very long. This is for adults when they were doing that testing. So you can see here they were negative and then up and down. But again, this is days, not weeks. So you, you have to get in there very quick. Is there any, like, mobile phone, or is there any rapid test for, I think um, there are, yeah, there are rapid tests. For PCR? For um, there are, well, for, for, for antigen. For antigen, yeah. We actually worked on one that's on the principle. <coughs> it's not for prime time yet, but it, I think it will work, which is, um, using uh, similar to what you do with a glucometer, that kind of method, for P24. I think it would be good because something that was cheap um, that you could do that for, a for antigen or for virus. How long to, to we use it in the field? For Not the yet, study? but you could, I mean, if you need somebody else to work on it. Yeah. yeah. No, we, we, we're publishing it. Um, but it's needed anyway. These were all the people they and the HIV infected children. This is from this is from Genenta uh, data. This is the study we did in Brazil, where we it's probably seven years ago now um, where we started it. We entered over 1,800 mother infant pairs were in Brazil, South Africa, and the United States, and some other places in South America. We had about six to eight percent infected at birth. And um, we have the samples still. I mean, that's why we're going to do some more studies on these samples. This was the results of the study. These were three arms um, using a backbone of AZT for six weeks. And they had two drugs for two weeks or three drugs for two weeks <laughs> following on the backbone. You must remember this was started back in 2002 or something like that. And the results were published in 2012. Showing efficacy. So these were the two drugs in terms of uh, transmission rate. So it was higher in the AZT alone, and it was reduced similarly in the other two arms. And so that's now changed the standard of care for, for babies. So we don't use just one AZT anymore. So this was, um, again, these are, this, these are all the individual samples on these, this large cohort. There were 100 and about 140 infected infants out of this large number. And <clears throat> what I want to just point out here is that uh, the viral load, looking at this, I thought was really interesting because um, 
you can see this is when they were born. A lot of these were in utero, so this is a wide span of what the viral load was at birth. This, this is three different arms. So, so here is the AZT arm the, in the blue, and then these are either AZ, AZT and nevirapine or three drugs, which is ZDV, 3TC, and nelfinavir. Um, but I, I, just the fact that it was able to drop this much, it didn't go to zero, points out that the new studies we're doing with intense therapy and not stopping at two weeks, um, the virus comes right back up again if you do. So these were all in the infected kids. So this was Debbie um, uh, who first published the Mississippi baby, a good friend of mine. <laughs> and. Um, then this was New England Journal of Medicine, um, high risk, exposed baby. And of all the places, Mississippi, I mean, who knew? Here we are, high tech and other places. And, um, and then this particular Dr. Hannah Gay uh, is the one that did this. So she treated the, the baby with um, three drugs uh, right away. And the, the problem in, in, in babies, we don't have a lot of choices for drugs. So they're not the they're not the best drugs, you know. We can't use a protease inhibitor right at birth because of some other effects. But we're getting more drugs so we can do it better. And then uh, they, she, she started what as a protease inhibitor at one week and continued on. And then it was the mother herself who, who um, went, went home and went out in rural Mississippi and thought, well, the baby doesn't need it anymore, so stopped. And, uh, and then Hannah Gay went, decided to go out there and find the baby. I mean, she did better than we do here in Los Angeles. <laughs> they found the baby and had the baby come back um, and test it again. And then what happened is she tested it and there was no RNA, there was no DNA. And so she said, uh, so then she did it again. And then she called Catherine Lazariaga and then it went around and then they said, well, that's wrong. Just send us a sample. Something's wrong, you know. No antibody either. So, um, <clears throat> so this was what happened here, and um, and so then after that, they they kept the baby off because um, uh, she had stopped it um, and uh, followed her. So, uh, what was she became? So it was reported, and it, there was there was DNA negative, replication confident virus, nothing. Uh, clinically well through 27 months. So there was, you know, all, all Debbie found in her very highly sensitive assays was an occasional at the limit of detection. She, you know, when there were six different replicates done, there might be one out of the six that had a signal occasionally, but not all the time, just once in a, so she said, well, I don't know what it means. So, um, so there were traces at limits of detection. Met definition of we made a we made a definition of if because before this anyone who stopped drugs was usually positive within a couple of weeks you know that we'd ever seen so um, so that she this child was off for a year and uh, and then she rebounded at oh you know 27 months so um, out of the blue nothing to tell us not to tell her ahead of time it was you know. So, um, so the implications were, a lot of people were disappointed with that, but that we know that it reduced viral reservoirs to unheard of low levels, um, below current level of detection in the peripheral blood for over 3.5 years and 27 months without any treatment. So even though it occurred, it's a, still a major advance because we learned that you could very significantly reduce reservoirs. <coughs> and uh, this ba baby also, had virus detectable for up to 21 days. I mean, it, the virus when it dropped, but it didn't, like it wasn't gone in a few days. It was 21 days of having virus. So um, I think where we're going now is having, doing two, th two or three things to try to prolong it. Um, so we ha had one here in LA. You probably heard about it last year. We're still following this baby that's, um, a baby that I helped uh, with the management. The baby's actually at Long Beach, but one of our sites. And um, this baby was 
premature delivery, 36 weeks, um, from a known infected mother, but she, she would come and go and not take her medicine. So, so she was known, but just walked in and delivered. <clears throat> so they'd actually um, tried to get her to start on therapy, but she, she took one pill and then. Um, so she was, the baby was started, we started just because it was such a high risk thing, um, at four hours of age and started the full therapy at a high dose. No, we don't. We don't use. Um, we don't generally use nevirapine in this country at birth, yeah. right? Yeah. Although we, because of the O4O study, which which uh, we may well be using uh, triple drugs at birth. I think it's it's rapid. That's what I'm saying. It's rapidly right. changing. Um, but anyway, so this baby was we, but we found out that the baby was positive at birth, and. Um, they actually did a spinal fluid on the baby as well because um, baby was sick, you know, acted sick, and then added tr treatment. So um, the baby tolerated it well, how was positive on day one, and it had a low RNA positive. Like if you're going to pick one out to treat, 217 copies is low. Um, the CSF though was positive, very low, but uh, at day six, sort of surprised but interesting. So, but the, on, the next sample was only done at day 10, but the DNA was negative at day 6. That's really, and um, the RNA was undetectable and remained undetectable. Um, the baby, uh, so the method definition of in utero, and um, uh, because, you know, when we were trying to publish the Mississippi baby, the biggest for the reviewers, they all said, well, we don't, and all, most of the adult people said, we don't believe the baby's really infected. But we said there were four different positive, you know, results. Nope, not infected. So that was the one of the major uh, reviews. <coughs> and so we said, yes, it is. And now, of course, when it rebounded, yes, uh, we told you it was infected. <laughs> 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 we told you so. <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. They did a sequencing and all that. They they didn't really have the original virus, but when the virus came <coughs> back, it was the one at the time. Um, yeah. So they proved that it wasn't. Re that was one of the questions. Could it be? It would be very unusual. Right. I don't know how you do it, but um, yeah. Um, so anyway, this is the the baby that we had, and uh, so right now um, we did careful. Um, we're still following up. Oh, this is the DNA. That's just the fancy way to show it there. So it's treated very, very early, earlier than the Mississippi Bay baby. So then looked at this through all these, really, the, what the best we got in terms of um, uh, detecting virus for this. And um, the only thing that was interesting is, again, um, this was this baby at um, different times over time. Let me just do this. So, but what we, what, what we, we think may be an important thing to do as well is that in the, in the wells, when, when Debbie and I do the same kind of test, um, do this dilution out, the wells that are negative for the virus, replication virus, can still, you can t detect DNA in some of them, proviral DNA. So we actually detected out to one month one month of age here um, in this baby, uh, evidence of non-induced proviral genomes. So they're not, you can't induce them to produce virus, but they're there. And then they disappeared after that. They became negative. And the baby's um, uh, April was a second year birthday. So um, we don't, we, we haven't decided what to do. <laughs> but the She's still on. Still on antivirals and absolutely normal and negative by every test. Oh yeah, they turn negative. <coughs> In children treated under three months of age, about 80 percent become negative. Um, so the infant's still on treatment, uh, had very rapid uh, loss of detection of non-induced proviral remnants by three months, faster than the Mississippi baby. Um, so we're going to discuss it with the family. Uh, it's a foster family. 
uh, who's taking care of the baby. And also potentially to evaluate reservoirs in the baby, like a GI and a spinal fluid. So the working definition that we made up by this committee, yeah? So, when, so if you take in the Mississippi baby, when she was taken off medication, then did the, viral, did the reservoir then show up? Yeah. No. That's, that was what was, you know, for, for 27 months after the baby was off antivirals, there was nothing. And then suddenly, 27 or maybe like a week beforehand. Yeah, so it just came, it just came from, you know, people ask, was there a vaccine? Was there something that would precipitate it? And no. Suddenly, up. And that's what's, that's why we are, uh, with our new studies, we're trying to figure out what criteria could you use and decide what you're going to do. Is spinal fluid a good marker of brain? Um, in the, we were talking about that last week, and I think, uh, yes, I don't know if it's super sensitive, but yes, we did that early on when we were doing uh, early studies, you know, in the past. So we're trying to pull, get the old spinal fluids that we have from around the country and look at them for other markers. <coughs> so anyway, and no evidence of immune activation. So, so it's sort of a working, it's a functional cure, so it could be a permanent disease remission in the absence of antiviral therapy. So prolonging remission is one of the first goals, to make it years without having to have antiviral treatment. And, and we don't even, we don't necessarily care if you lose every bit of virus as long as it doesn't come back, it doesn't cause any problem. So um, this is the idea that um, immediate antiviral therapy, so that the longer you wait, um, the bigger the reservoir gets. Um, and uh, I, I propose this study of doing intensive therapy for babies immediately. Um, I think well, many years ago, so many years ago, and everybody said, mm, no. So, um, but it's, uh, it's now, it's open. Uh, it's open as of last year. So this was for uh, early treatment. And a lot of the things that came out of this is sort of like, how do you diagnose the babies right away? So we, we, we have a global network and we have, what, 60-something sites around the, the globe. Um, and uh, so we had to go to each one to figure out how fast they can get a, a, a result. You know, if you did it today, can you get it? The faster you get it, the better you know, because it was an issue about should you start therapy in all these kids and then stop? Um, so that's sort of where we are, and we're going to, we're doing it. Is that what it. you're doing? You're starting in everybody? <coughs> We're starting in all the high risk. So in other words, they have to meet the criteria of the mother not being treated for this particular study. So yes, we're doing it. I wonder, hmm, oh there. So it's high risk infants and we're using three drugs and that's all we have. And then if the PCR is positive at birth, we'll add Kaletra, so it would be four drugs and um, follow all these areas and then we're talking about a criteria for treatment interruption, like here we are with the baby from here. And um, most of these, I think we have enrolled, uh, not that many, they're about to open up internationally, but we have one positive, one infected baby from Miami. And uh, so we think that we will have better assays, hopefully, by the time they make the age of two. And so this is a unique opportunity. It's a feasible high-risk population. Um, and we think we can get them in from Brazil, South Africa, Haiti, everywhere. Um, and even if it doesn't result in cure, we'll have um, potential functional cure. And then that whole cohort of children will grow up with the low reservoirs. So as we mature and learn other things to do, I think finding the cohort, and there's many more out there, like in Brazil right now since we started doing this that are, are there and they have low reservoirs. So they're the, the best population to do these interventions. Um, this was, got a lot of press and science doing this. This is our scientific cure impact committee, um, which is actually a small number of people but a lot of, 
um, other people um, helping. And so this is where we are. We want not only want to do early treatment, but we want to look at chronically infected youth um, in a variety of ways. And also, I think, finding that cohort of early treated youth now, not just um, sexually transmission, but um, so that we can, they're the, they're the group that we're going to be the most successful with. And then uh, it's obviously different in growing children, the relationship of a developing immune system in the face of all this. Um, so these are one of the things, these are the same things we're talking about. This is from the committee, but what's, um, what's exciting right now is that we have the okay to go ahead and study the new broad, more than one broad neutralizing antibody. So the idea we're going to add that um, to the intense regimen for the babies, um, as well as uh, probably do some study when we're taking them off interruption randomizing between whatever we got, the antibody for one versus the other, and our antibody plus a vaccine if we had it, a therapeutic vaccine. So I think we'll learn a lot in a small number of um, studies, small number, number. And this is the broad neutralizing antibody, and the <coughs> VCR01 is the one that NIH made, and there are others coming along. There's a whole bevy of them. And I think people are pretty excited, and in adults as well, pretty excited. So this is building on this concept so that we're going to add in. At the same time, we're evaluating other drugs like in integrase inhibitors in infants, which is almost done um, with rituglavir. Then there's others, and Maravarok. They all have different mechanisms, and the idea would be to treat intensely, um, like you do like for cancer, like you like early on in infants and in adults as well, um, and see if you can uh, reduce the reservoirs to the lowest possible level. Um, so that's the, that's the plan. Um, I'm going to mention, I don't know, how long do I have? I'm not going to be Take much. Okay, I'm just going to talk because I'm also involved in um, another study. Um, so this is a single case of cure for the Berlin patient. You've probably seen him. He's been around. He's been here a few times. And uh, he said, why me? <laughs> I'm not that good of a guy. That's what he told me. And I thought, oh, I think you're fine. Um, so he had relapse of AML, chemotherapy, radiation. And then the difference between him and what you've probably heard about is that he got, from a bone marrow, he got resistant uh, uh, cells, naturally resistant. And he also had graft-versus-host disease, and it was a concept. And he's still uh, seven years follow-up, and I think it's, that's 2010, so it's longer. Uh, and he had the <clears throat> they did all kinds of biopsies on him. Uh, they did everything on him. And this was like defining cure in the Berlin patient. I mean, they even, he even ended up getting a brain biopsy uh, for another reason, not, not just for curiosity. But he basically then um, uh, have, has no rebound or detectable. So why hasn't it happened again? Why don't you hear about a bunch of these? It's because if you're doing bone marrow, they don't test bone marrow in a natural way for CCR5. So um, the Hutter has been looking ever since for getting some more. And so um, <coughs> I think that's. Is there no way to? find this natural host. Yeah, so I'll tell you how we're doing it. Um, so anyway, this is the natural CCR5. It's greatest in Caucasian, 1% uh, are homozygous. It, they thought it might be involved with the plague back in ancient times, that those that survived the plague were more likely to have this. <coughs> so, it, it, And um, <coughs> there's a lot of heterozygous people around, 15 to 20%. So it's resistant, and um, what, what we decided to do was um, uh, use cord blood. Cord blood you can test easily for. Cord blood is used routinely in, in our cancer and our transplant cases. They don't use it as much in adults, but they do do it. And um, <clears throat> so we proposed that, I think I wrote a grant, 
an R21, that they thought that's interesting, but they sort of laughed at me. <laughs> but, but we went ahead anyway, and stem site, the cord blood bank here in Los Angeles, has, it was being testing and has now um, greater than 220 units that are available right here now, and they're matched, HLA matched, and so we have that many cord blood units. Um, and so uh, the plan is they're continuing to get samples sent from the other cord blood banks to test for CCR5 homozygous um, uh, so that we would have at least 300 units at any one point. And um, so the, I wanted to know back a while, uh, quite a long time ago, whether uh, since our patients are diver uh, diverse ethnically, whether this sort of Caucasian gene, and I was surprised to find that in, we took 44 of our kids here and did HLA on them and see if they would match. And I think they only had, um, they only had, I think, 30 in the bank at the time, 30 units. But we found out of those 44 kids, surprisingly, which were mixed Hispanic, black, you know, um, that seven out of 44 had a four or six greater match with the identified units, and now we have 220. So actually, it's surprising, and everybody, even though they might call themselves a certain ethnic diversity, they're a mixture, um, more than a mixture than people think. And so these were, I, I wanted to know how many children had uh, cancer as well as HIV. So we just did a, a, this is not a good survey, but it was like, how many do you remember kind of survey, and we found 24 at that time, which was quite a, from our domestic sites. So, um, and there's another thing that we're becoming aware of, that there are more perinatally HIV-infected kids who are like in their 20s, early 20s, who are having failing bone marrows. So the idea we were doing this is that because this is still <coughs> a very significant thing to do, to do a transplant, it's not something you do lightly, it's not going to be done. Um, but it's sort of, again, as a proof of concept. If someone's getting a transplant, they need it for themselves, adults or kids, um, then why not get one that's resistant? Um, so the advantages of a cord blood is that it's widely available, that also you don't need a six out of six match like you do out of a bone, bone marrow. You can get away with four, it's okay, four of six and six of six doesn't make a lot of difference. Um, they also have uh, less likelihood of graft versus host because they're stem cells. They're baby stem cells. So um, you don't have this, this really bad, which is one of the side, side effects of transplant. The disadvantage is that, is that it takes longer to engraft depending on the cell dose. So in other words, that's why they haven't done it as much in adults because they're bigger, so they need a certain number of cells to like grow. And the cell dose is critical uh, you can sometimes use two, two cords, um, and, uh, but the new plan is that we, over this process, there's a doctor who's in Cornell um, who is a hemog transplanter adult, and he has had a lot of experience with using haplo plus cords. So he uses, like if you have a, a mother or a, a relationship that has a half, half match, then you can use that, and that sort of is like a feeder. So the other one will take and uh, and graft faster. So uh, this is the estimates of probability of finding a match if you had 300. So for adults, 27% um, chance because you have to have the right amount of cells. For pediatric patients, it's a lot easier because they're smaller. So you'd have a 73% chance. And um, this was stuff I did as part of this where I took, actually the, the Berlin patient also, when you took out his cells after he had the transplant and you look in vitro to see if you could infect him, which is just simple, um, I looked at, this is actually, um, this is cord bloods that are, um, let me see, yeah, this is just showing um, from a, these were actual cord bloods. So one was heterozygous for CCR5, one was a normal, 
and normally you can infect, but this is the homozygous cord. You can't infect in vitro. So it's, it's a way to see, like, also you could see how many cells does it take to be resistant. You know, I haven't done that experiment because the cord blood bank wouldn't give me any more. Um, but this is from a patient who was not HIV infected, but just got one of these. These, were, these are part of the bank, so you could get them, uh, the resistant. And so I took the, from a person who received a transplant, their cells and found out again that uh, their cells after the CCR5 homozygous transplant were also not infected. You couldn't infect them in vitro. Uh, so this is the, the other study that we're doing that um, <clears throat> is now open nationwide here for adults and kids to do, a to do cord blood transplant. And it's not invasive. It's like they're getting it anyway, so all we're doing is following them. And uh, so it's a prospective pre-transplant cohort. So the, any age over 12 months of age who need a transplant will, and we'll help them find a match. So in other words, if someone's going to get a transplant, we'll say, we'll screen the bank for you. And any other match that you have will also screen, so you could choose the best match. And um, so this is basically, they do exactly what they would do normally but they were just, were just following them and collecting samples. And so I won't go through all this, but it's looking at chimerism for it, the timing of when they uh, engraft, and then looking at similar to the Berlin patient. Um, stopping therapy is not part of it, but it would be done if they decided to stop antivirals at some point. These are the sites. The blue ones are the, we had to, Talk about trouble. This was a lot of trouble. Trying to set up between the hemog people, the adult, and the pediatric, um, and the adult ACTG and the pediatric group. And, uh, but um, there, and what we also decided, this is sort of practical, is they have to fill out forms that are part of the bulk, a transplant. And they have like reams of forms. So we're using the same forms. And then they're centrally going to, um, you know, so they don't have to do double work. So we'll make it easier. So this is to, and, and we understand that this may be just further understand pathogenesis and provide a protocol for consistent collection and cord blood. Um, so basically, we expect to enroll not very many, but um, at least uh, we hope that if this works again, then we could, people who are doing gene therapy or zinc finger technology, this would be something that, that is worth doing, pursuing. These are all the people. And uh, I'm just going to show you, just because you heard about these other transplants that didn't work, you probably did. There were two reported from um, Harvard where they <coughs> did, they, this, the difference between them, just so you know, is that these two transplants, um, they first of all reported of them like they were going to be cured. Um, but uh, they, were, they did not get homozygous. They just got wild type. Because there was an argument among the people, was it the transplant itself and the graft versus host that worked, or was it because they had resistant cells? And this is probably an example when you're talking about trying to get the virus out. Or This is the ultimate example of that. You can't do better than like taking all their cells, giving them chemotherapy, and then transplanting them. That should get, if there's any way to get rid of it, that should be the way to get rid of it. So what they did find, and indeed, um, in both of these, patient A and patient B, they, they engrafted, and they had all the tests, the same kind of tests we were doing, were, became negative. They became seronegative. They became DNA negative. They didn't have any replication competent virus. Then after a while, they stopped the therapy. I, I can't remember how, it's pretty far out they did. Yeah, and they d the other things like all these other markers of replication um, turned out to be negative. But the problem was they both, they took a while. They took longer to reactivate. They had some remission. One of them had longer than the other, but it came back. So um, the reason is they, you probably need that resistant uh, donor cell. You, you can't just, it's not just giving a, 
It's not gra just graft host disease. It's not just, you know, the transplant. But it also says that it's probably no matter what we do with all these SDAC reversals and all that to reduce it, you're going to have to do something else as well. So I think that's what delayed rebound suggests the need for additional strategy. So that's, I think, where we are. Um, uh, resistant cells, immune enhancement, vaccine, and neutralizing antibody is a combination. Um, and, and definitely in those that are uh, chronic infection. So these are reports that was at the CORI meeting, the last CORI meeting. There's, they've tried this in other, in Europe, actually, Barcelona patient. Um, a lot of them, they can't tell. They engrafted fine, but uh, the cancer came back in this case. Um, Recurrent of Karen's, this is a, a German group that they had slow engraftment. I don't know why they stopped the R ARV, but then HIV rheumia came back. Um, I think you have to, if you, the bone marrow transplants takes at least a year for the cells to all go in, you know, and so you shouldn't stop, you know. So I was talking to them, and there's another one from the Boston group, which is, um, I think a cord blood, they did a cord blood transplant and the patient has engrafted and they're following. And actually we enrolled a patient <laughs> in the study I'm talking about, a 48 year old who had a Hodgkin's disease lymphoma. He received the cord and the haplo. And amazingly to me anyway, because I do this all the time, I mean I, I follow transplant patients, engrafted on day 18, usually it takes six weeks. So and then was out of the hospital on day set 27, he just sailed through this with no problems. And uh, the only problem <coughs> that he had was that um, he had partial engraftment with the cord. So he had a time where he had, what usually happens with a haplo is that you have both the cord and the haplo. And, but he, he lost both of them and he got his own cells back. So, over a period, this all happened since January, so this is all very recent. And he's, he's clinically well, and um, his cancer's in remission right now, and he's, he's um, his viral load is negative, but he's still on uh, ARVs. So he, he did very well, he's disappointed that, and the, Dr. Von Beeson said this was, um, he only has about 5% who don't have a uh, engra full engraftment, so he plans to do other transplants. It'll probably be more in adults because there's more cancer in adults. So, um, so this is the advantage is that it's more rapid engraftment. The cord takes over the haplocells, so usually the cord will win, will win out. And uh, in using this in 70 other patients who had cancer, there was no increased risk of lapse doing it this way. And uh, allows single cord or in adults or adolescents, so it's an advantage. So the challenges, and I'm almost done, <laughs> is that we now have more knowledge about the goals, similar to cancer advances. Um, remission to cure, so we're, we're really talking about remission and then cure on a stepwise approach. We need better assays to assess remission, as I told you, because they're not good enough, you know. Um, and innovative ways to assess reservoirs that are not so invasive, if we could, like looking, you know, um, for PET scans or whatever, some other way to, to see, and in the gut, and then enhance host resistance, the things about the antibody and all this. So I think, you know, for you guys especially, um, it's an interaction, and we want this to be um, important, not just here, but in, but, uh, in where, the, where the biggest problems are. And so, obviously, prevention is the best, but um, still, the, those that are already infected or are getting infected, um, I think we can make a difference. And, and um, so the things that you, that you do so well, you know, the behavioral and like making it happen. Um, so the, the, the advances in technology and science have to be translated into what you're really going to do. So that's the challenge. And uh, never underestimate the power of one. This is him, Ryan White. Elizabeth, my friend from uh, Pediatric AIDS. Um, this little boy in South Africa that changed things. Uh, Elizabeth, and that's my patient there, Elizabeth. And, um, 
And so she, she saw her before she died, when she had grown up and had a baby of her own. And so, thanks.